Hi, welcome to the second online class for our class. Uh, so last time we finished up talking about industrial and post-industrial societies. How sustainable are they? Looking mostly at the U.S. consumption and also industrial food production. So today we're starting a new section in the course, which is looking at other types of societies throughout time and space and looking at how they've interacted with their environments, managed their resources, has it been sustainable or not? And what can we learn from these other societies to help inform our own future directions for sustainability? And so we'll start off first looking at sustainability in complex farming societies, pre-industrial ones, starting with the Maya, the ancient Maya. And so the ancient Maya are located in Central um, and Central America, excuse me, mostly in Guatemala and also Belize, highlighted down in the orange on the map. The ancient lowland Maya are known for their impressive architecture, their writing and calendrical systems, and complex civilization. And the ancient lowland Maya civilization spanned roughly a 2500 year period from about 1000 BCE to 1500 current era. Evidence for the first dynasties and kings starts to appear about 250 AD, but really the climax uh, the culmination of Maya civilization is known as the Late Classic Period, which is from 800 to 900 CE, current era. This is the time when the most impressive buildings were built. For example, pictured on the slide is architecture from the city of Tikal, which had a population up to 400,000 at one point, which was considered relatively high, at least by Jared Diamond. Um, Also, they were a stratified society, so uh, different social classes, including commoners, the peasants, which mostly farmed, also nobles and kings, sort of the elite. And according to Maya society, the kings were considered holy or divine rulers. Uh, the word they had for them was chulahau. And so kings were basically asserted familial relationships to gods. They were considered half human and half divine, half god. And so because kings claim to have supernatural affinity, supernatural powers, uh, they could basically speak with the gods. This is why the peasants were willing to support their luxurious lifestyle, build their palaces, feed them corn, feed them venison, because the king, by being part divine, made an implicit promise to the peasants that things would go well. The rain would come, things would be prosperous, the crops would grow. Keeping in mind um, that the kings would possibly get in trouble if things didn't go well, if people began to run out of food or the rains weren't coming, because this would be sort of tantamount to the king breaking his royal promise, being half divine to make sure things will go well. And another thing about the Maya at this time is they have a relatively high population density, uh, roughly 5 million people in the er an area the size of Colorado. A little bit about the Maya environment that they inhabited. Semi-tropical and also marked by unpredictable rainfall, either um, within years or between years, and this porous terrain called karst. Uh, you can see the karst on the slide. It's this porous, rocky limestone terrain. And because rainfall is unpredictable in this environment, the north and the south of the Maya had different strategies for getting water. Um, so in the north, the elevation is lower, and as you move southward, the elevation increases to higher levels. In the north, it tends to be drier, there's less rainfall, and so, but the elevation is low enough, they were able to utilize these uh, things called cenotes, basically these deep sinkholes uh, or caves in the cars that they could sort of plug up the holes in the cars and store water or dig wells down up to 75 feet down. So in the north, it's drier, but they're low enough to the water table and elevation to utilize groundwater. In the south, even though there's more rainfall, the elevation is higher 
And so people are too high above the water table, the groundwater, to access it. They couldn't use cenotes or wells. However, they had a different strategy in the south. They used natural depressions that occurred in the karst and then modified them and plugged, them, plugged the holes up in the karst to create reservoirs in order to store water for the dry season. So the Maya were well known for their massive monumental architecture, writing systems, calendrical systems, and major construction of all monuments essentially ceases after 1810. What you're seeing on the graph is a number of sites that are engaged in producing monuments at the time. So that's on the vertical axis and then time in years AD on the horizontal axis. And so you can see the number of sites involved in monumental architecture continually increases up until this point, stops around 1810 and never really picks back up, never occurs thereafter. And it's at this point that Diamond argues Maya civilization has collapsed. <clears throat> Different symptoms of the collapse, and we'll sort of talk about each in more detail. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, for one line of evidence Diamond gives is rapid depopulation of the countryside, the Maya hinterlands, and the ceremonial centers, so the urban centers as well. And he says this happens in just 50 to 100 years. You also see a complete abandonment of administ administrative and residential structures. And at this time, a complete cessation of all building, all construction of monuments, stopped uh, stopping of all carving of sculpted monuments and they also stopped manufacturing pottery stonework jade carvings and their classical calendrical long count system and writing system so all the stuff all the hallmarks of maya civilization that they're well known for basically ceases at this point One of the reasons Diamond argues the Maya collapse has to do with their agricultural system, um, how they were managing their environment, which Diamond argues they eventually ran up against some limitations. It's sort of a Malthusian argument, if you will. So first off, the Maya would have used some slash and burn agriculture for farming. Um, so remember slash and burn, um, you have a plot of land, you slash down, chop down all the vegetation on that plot, burn it and then incorporate the ash into the soil. This does several things. It adds carbon and other valuable nutrients back into the soil. It also makes it less acidic, um, a more balanced pH, which is good for growing plants. So they would have done slash and burn agriculture, but this method is too extensive. It requires too much land for really large populations um, because after you grow crops on one plot of land, after you slash and burned it, you can do that for a few seasons, a few harvests, and then you have to leave that plot fallow for several years, even 10 to 20 years, and let that soil regenerate, go back, re-slash that plot down, um, and grow again. And so you have to rotate plots and use a lot of land to do slash and burn agriculture. You wouldn't be able to support the large populations we see among po uh, the classic Maya with just slash and burn. And so they also would have been practicing intensified agriculture. So not just spreading out, slashing and burning different fields, um, but also putting more effort, intensifying their efforts on the same plot of land to get more yield out of that same area. Um, so they practice intensified farming uh, to grow corn, i.e. maize, cacao, maguay, bananas, squash, beans, and also cotton for weaving. And remember, it, in, um, extensified versus intensified agriculture. Extensified, you're extending, you're spreading out, you're using more land to get more food. Intensification, you're not spreading out, you're using the same amount of land, but you're putting more labor, more effort, more technology perhaps into that plot of land to get more food out of it. So things like irrigation, adding fertilizer, these are all forms of intensification for farming. They also didn't have a lot of meat, the Maya. It was rarely eaten because it was difficult to find, and when it was found, it was expensive. It was usually reserved for the elite, things like venison. Dogs and turkeys were kept as the main animals, um, as pets, and sometimes food. Beyond this, they didn't really have uh, any large animals that they hunted. 
or domesticated. Um, so there may have been a lack of protein in the diet. It's not being supplemented with meat. And so what Diamond says happened is Maya agriculture had limitations and it began to run up against these um, on, on how much food they basically could produce. And they were mainly producing corn. So about 75% of the Maya diet was corn based. And the corn diet was pretty much for the whole population, commoners and elite although elite did have more access to protein, to meat. Um, and the way that archaeologists deduce this, what, how do you know what people were eating you know, a thousand years ago, is through the skeletal remains of the ancient Maya. And so when we eat different foods, different plants take up nutrients like carbon through different biochemical pathways. We have what's called C3 and C4 grasses. And they're marked by the different biochemical pathway in which they uptake Carbon. It, it leaves a signature basically when you eat C3 versus C4 grasses. They leave different isotopic signatures in the skeletal remains of the individuals that were eating them. So you can tell if someone was eating C3 grasses like wheat from the isotopic signature in their bones or were they eating C4 grasses, things like corn or even corn fed beef. And so we know the majority of the diet was based off corn. And another thing about corn is it's low in protein relative to other grains. Um, for example, grains like uh, barley or wheat. On top of that, most of the corn's diet, there's not much pro excuse me, most of the diet's corn, there's not much protein in that, and they're not supplementing it with other sources of protein. No large domesticated animals. Again, all they had was dogs, turkeys, and ducks for for pets and or food. And so you need a lot of peasants growing corn to feed the entire population. Another problem uh, or constraint of Maya agriculture is they had relatively low productivity. So what I mean is in the US today, one farmer can feed roughly another 120 people. That's high productivity. Um, for the Maya, one farming family could produce enough to feed them and maybe another family right that's lower even the egyptians had ancient egyptians had low agricultural productivity compared to today but even they could supply five people per farming family um so the maya had really low productivity you needed a lot of people engaged in farming to produce enough food to feed the whole population And so Diamond says essentially the Maya ran up against these agricultural limitations in their environment. And this is what helped lead to the collapse. He uses a case study from one of the main urban centers, Copan, uh, which is located sort of down on the bottom right of the map there on the northwest corner of Honduras. He uses Copan to illustrate what happened. And so Copan had a peak population of 27,000 between 750 and 900 current era. Uh, he considers this a high population density for the area. Uh, how do you estimate population density when the people are no longer there? Uh, archaeologists have numerous methods for doing this. One of them is you can analyze uh, residential structures. How many residential structures are left behind? They look different than say commercial um, or economic structures, and then sort of estimate a certain number of people per house, um, do the math, and that's kind of how you get your population estimate. You can reference Diamond if you're interested in how he did it. Um, and so really high population growth uh, leading to this large dense population by 750-800 CE. They were also at this time, this is the time of the most construction, building massive royal monuments, glorifying the kings. Construction gets especially massive between 650 and 700 CE. Uh, after 700 CE, it's not just the kings that the peasants are building monuments for, but nobles and lesser kings begin erecting their own palaces. Um, just for example, there's about 20 of these lesser palaces or palaces for lesser nobles on top of the ones they're building for the real kings. Um, one palace, for example, had 50 rooms in it with room for about 250 people. Um, so this is putting a huge burden on the Copan peasants.
Um, yeah, again, they're they're building, they're they're supplying all the food, they're building cities for the kings, and now for sort of the lesser kings as well. Another piece of evidence Diamond uses, he uses several to sort of weave his argument together, is this stone monument. Um, and so the stone altar might have been used, it was maybe going to be a, a platform for a throne for a king. And so one side is completed, but the other side is left unfinished. The Maya text on it shows a date equivalent to February 10th, 822, and there's no, it's not finished, and there's no known monuments after this date, basically, at Copan. <clears throat> Another thing, uh, the environment. Maya were running up against limitations. And so this is Copan Valley. Uh, the, the valley bottom lands are the most fertile in terms of soil and growing crops. It has this rich alluvial soil. Um, the hillsides are much less fertile. And so the, the first area my, the Maya would have farmed would be the valley bottom lands. Um, but eventually by about 650 CE, people start to occupy and farm the hillsides as well. Because the hillsides aren't as productive, um, they're, they're, the valley bottom lands are like two to three times more productive. You can grow a lot more food versus the hillsides. The other thing about the hillsides is they suffer from rapid erosion. People are deforesting them for fuel wood, for house building, and to convert that land into agricultural fields. And so you start to get a ton of erosion as well. Um, the hill populations reached about 41% of the population. So almost half the population was living in the hills. Um, and shortly thereafter, they were there for about a century, the hillsides became, became abandoned. Uh, the likely reason is probably erosion. Uh, there's evidence for erosion below the hillsides of Copan. Some of the houses near the hill have debris inside them um, that fell down from the hillside from over farming on the hills. Uh, and that's what Diamond argues the cause was. People ran out of land in the valley, started farming the hillsides because they had no other choice. Again, sort of a Malthusian argument, growing population in the context of dwindling resources. Farm the hillsands, hillsides for as long as they could till they eroded. Um, and then the hillsides were essentially uh, abandoned after that. So the erosion seems to have begun in the mid-8th century, century and then continued for several years, hundreds of years after that. Um, at some point, the houses in Copan were completely abandoned. Uh, some of them were entirely buried by erosion debris, so it wouldn't have been habitable anymore. And so we have deforestation, erosion, a growing population that is growing less food at a time when more was needed. And this starts to, there starts to be evidence in the archeological record for malnutrition, for deteriorating health among the Maya, um, especially among the commoners. And so um, a couple of different things you can look at. If you wanna study the health, uh, well-being, the lifestyle, disease, injury of past populations, a lot of information is encoded in the skeletal remains that get left behind. Um, for example, things like tuberculosis, things like syphilis, all leave markers on the skeleton. So be careful what you're doing uh, because archaeologists in the future are going to be able to tell. And so they start seeing evidence for malnutrition in the Maya archaeological record. Uh, one of the main things that Diamond talks about that was found is, some, is there's evidence for anemia among the population. Anemia meaning iron deficiency. Um, their diet was deficient in iron, and iron's a really important nutrient for a few reasons. Um, one, we need iron to create a protein in our blood called hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is the protein in our red blood cells that transports oxygen around our body. So you need iron to create hemoglobin. Remember, the Maya were eating mostly corn, which is low in protein relative to other grains, and they didn't really have any other supplements, like for meat. And so they were iron deficient. The way the body will respond to this, to this malnutrition, iron deficiency, is because you don't have enough iron to create en enough hemoglobin to properly transport oxygen around your body via your red blood cells. What your body will do is it will try to create more red blood cells to compensate, to, to compensate and transport more oxygen around your body. And so red blood cells are produced in the bony regions of of the skeleton, especially the skull, 
And so when the body's iron deficient, the body responds by making more red blood cells. And in order to do that, it expands the red blood cell production surface area, which are the marrow producing regions of the bone. So what you're seeing on the slide in that sun spongy portion of the skull, that's an actual picture of a Maya skull. And here's a better picture of what I'm talking about. It's called parotid hyperostosis. It's that sort of spongy uh, looking portion of the skull. Again, what you're seeing is an expansion of the bone, the surface area where red blood cells are produced to try to compensate from this lack of iron, this iron deficiency. And so this pops up on something like 80% of the skeletons found at Copan, major evidence for malnutrition. Um, another piece of evidence archaeologically for malnutrition and this is just to further sort of elaborate how archaeologists can deduce these types of things. Something called linear enamel hypoplasia. You can see that on the bottom right of the slide. You see those lines in the teeth, those horizontal lines? That's what we call linear enamel hypoplasia. And it's also indicative of malnutrition, that this individual underwent not just one, but several periods of malnutrition. So when your body isn't getting enough nutrients or enough of the right types of nutrients, it will dedicate the resources it is getting to its most important functions, keeping your heart pumping, things like that. And it will take resources away from less important functions your body does, like enamel formation on your teeth. So during periods of malnutrition, enamel formation on this individual's teeth, for example, actually stopped. It arrests itself so that your body can maintain other more essential functions. And then the enamel will begin to reform again once proper nutrition is restored. And so you can see on the teeth on the bottom right, this you can count up not just single periods of malnutrition, but how many periods they underwent because it'll leave a mark on the teeth each time. Um, and so these are some of the ways archeologists can infer, you know, how are people living in their environments? How are they using their resources? And what was the effect? What was the result? for them. In this case, lots of evidence of malnutrition. Um, and it wasn't just among commoners. They also had evidence for malnutrition among the elite, the, the upper classes of the Maya society. So this is an elite skeleton. It also has evidence of anemia on it, the parotid hyperostosis on the skull, although you can't really see it from the photo. How do you know that this is an elite individual rather than a commoner? <clears throat> There's a few different ways. Um, one is grave goods. What was the individual buried with? Is it, you know, digging sticks and a couple of farming tools? Or is it, you know, elaborate stone carvings and pottery and weaponry and things like that? Um, so that can tell you a bit about the status of the individual. In this case, the individual skull shown on the slide something called head binding going on. And so the ancient Maya used to bind the shape of the skull into this elongated shape you're seeing on the slide. It was considered aesthetically pleasing to them. Um, we do body modification too, right? Tattoos, jewelry, among other things. Um, so body modification, it's an elite status symbol, this head binding. So you can see this is an elite individual had uh, evidence of malnutrition as well. It wasn't just affecting the lower classes, it was affecting the entire population. So Jared Diamond's interpretation. <clears throat> Excuse me. At, um, during 1850, the royal palace at Copan, where we've been talking about, was burned. And Diamond says this is evidence of a commoner revolt. Again, a growing population, in the context of a deteriorating environment and the elites, the kings, which sort of divinely promised to make things go well, fail to sell, solve people's problems. They probably would have been a scapegoat for people's problems. And he suggests this is why, this might be why the palace was burned um, at this time. And it might also explain why the last we hear from the king on the long count calendar on that altar I showed you a few slides ago was 1822. Further evidence for the collapse, um, population decline in Copan Valley. By 1250, the valley in Copan was completely empty. Uh, on the slide here is mahogany pollen that dates to around 1200 to 1250 in Copan Valley. Mahogany pollen would only be present in areas of tall forest, uh, not agricultural fields. And so what you're seeing is by this time, Copan had returned 
to forest, um, whatever it sort of was before the Maya inhabited it and transformed the landscape. <clears throat> They'd abandon it. So Jared Diamond's interpretation. It's essentially a Malthusian argument in a lot of ways. Population was growing um, and outstripping the food supply. People began to farm the hillsides to try to correct for this. Um, eventually, they were no longer able to do so. Um, the hillsides became lose most of their pro productivity in less than a, than a decade, so you only get a few years out of that. Plus, the erosion on the hillsides was covering up the good soil on the valley bottomlands. Um, people were able to grow less food at a time when they needed more. On top of that, the the area was being deforested for fuel wood, for construction, and for to make agricultural fields, um, leaving even less sort of resources, causing more erosion, diluting the farming soil even more. And as people would have had less food at a time when they needed more, we would see these Malthusian checks start to set in, fighting warfare over resources, disease, famine, malnutrition, as people aren't getting enough resources to stay healthy. Um, he does mention a few other factors. It's not just a Malthusian argument. Um, he says drought also occurs at this time, and this probably exacerbates the Maya's problems. Um, again, they're at a time when they need more food. Uh, drought, unpredictable rainfall results in even less productivity. And he mentions that the kings and nobles failed to solve the commoners' problems. Um, he sort of says, Diamond says that the elites, the kings, were focused on these short-term concerns of enriching themselves, waging wars, erecting monuments, competing with each other, being aggrandizing. And he says, to quote, like most leaders throughout human history, Maya elites did not heed long-term problems insofar as they perceived them. Um, he sort of says that Maya kings are very similar to the, our leaders today, our CEOs of modern corporations, the economic and political elite. Uh, he says, like other ancient leaders in other cultures, Maya kings sought to outdo each other with more impressive temples covered with thicker and thicker plastic, plaster, reminiscent in turn of the extravagant conspicuous consumption of American CEOs. The passivity of Easter chiefs and Maya kings, he talks about more than the Maya in his book Collapse, the passivity of Maya kings in the face of real big threats to their society completes the list of parallels of why societies collapse. So one thing about Diamond's book Collapse, it's got a case study on the Maya as well as a bunch of other case studies of societies that he argues collapsed. And the main theme running through his book is these societies ran up against environmental limitations. They degraded their environment and their leaders were concerned with their own individual benefits rather than solving the problems of the broader society. It's basically a parallel to what he thinks is going on today um, in our own society and the developed world. It's kind of an interesting parallel. Um, it's compelling, but others would argue that Diamond misinterprets the evidence and that it's not really quite that simple. And no matter how tempting it might be to try to sort of create a lesson from the past and project that onto the present so that we can learn from it, we need to be careful not to misconstrue history, um, no matter how badly that lesson today might be needed. And so you read two pieces for today's discussion, the Diamond article, The Maya Collapse, and then you read a second piece by McEnany and Negron, Bellicose Rulers and Climatological Peril, question mark, right? So bellicose, meaning sort of inclined to fighting, um, caring about themselves, aggrandizing, and climatological peril, environmental degradation. Is this what happened to the Maya? Is this why they collapsed? They, McEnany and Negron, accused Diamond of essentially retrofitting 21st century woes, our problems today, onto the 8th century Maya um, to try to give us a lesson into what could happen if we don't start doing things differently. Um, that's great, but it's not necessarily accurate. And so McEnany and Negron, they argue it's more complex and they bring um, other evidence and context to bear in their case study of the Maya and they suggest a very different outcome of what happened to the Maya.
So, Nicanani and Negron say Diamond's interpretation of what happened to the Maya is too simplistic. They accuse him of being consumed by this Hollywood apocalypto caricature. Um, I know that all of us are too young to remember the movie by Mel Gibson, Apocalypto. Um, came out several years ago, but it sort of portrays the Maya and several other cultures that Mel Gibson merges into one. He never claims it to be historically accurate, but it portrays them as these sort of ancient bloodthirsty leaders that really don't give a shit about their population. And so Nick and Annie and Negron say this, this is not true, right? It's sort of a reminiscent of Hollywood, but doesn't really represent how the Maya necessarily lived. Uh, they point out that despite the population decline that Diamond talks about from 800 to 1000 CE, the Maya population was growing again by 1500. Does that collapse? Also, Diamond talks about um, collapse of their farming systems in the face of environmental change and degradation, but evidence shows the Maya had a lot of heterogeneity in their farming systems. So meaning that they had different strategies, different adaptations to grow food in different types of regions of their environment. And they also responded to the environmental changes that occurred. We'll look at some examples here shortly. So if collapse is defined as the complete end of those political systems and their accompanying civilization framework, the end, the collapse of the Maya, did this actually happen to the Maya? Um, you know, the Maya are still around today. So is that collapse? The Kinani and Nehran argue they didn't collapse. They didn't run up against environmental limitations with a growing population and an apathetic elite that didn't care. They say it's more nuanced than that. And the Maya actually represent, not collapse, but a highly resilient society that was able to adapt and change in response to a changing world. So Nick and Annie and Negron sort of go through the six strands of evidence that Diamond uses to argue for collapse. We'll look at each in detail, sort of what Diamond said and the response of Mick and Annie and Negron. So first, Diamond argues that one piece of evidence for Maya collapse is this huge increase in warfare, which is evidenced on their hieroglyphs and their writing systems. During the late classic period, 600 to 850 CE, Maya hieroglyphs and texts illustrate tons of different instances of warfare. The accounts of warfare not only become more numerous at this time, but also more elaborate. They, they talk much more about it. Um, okay, so this is true. This does happen. But what McEnany and Negron point out is these increases in hieroglyphs of warfare. These exist alongside more accounts of every category of royal activity. So there's not just more writing about war, but also marriage, trade, um, ritual. There's more writing about everything. It could simply reflect an increase in the Maya writing down what they were doing. Also, most of Maya farmers, most of the population were farmers, right? Remember about 70% of the, of the Maya were peasants to support everyone else on corn. And so that's true, but most, most Maya lived in the hinterlands. And so the extent to which they would have been affected by warfare and conflicts between dynasties remains an unanswered question, right? Um, just because there's a war going on in our world doesn't mean we're necessarily majorly impacted by it. We could be, but it's sort of a major assumption. Um, a lot of the population is living really far away from these urban centers where these conflicts are sort of occurring. Um, and so one other thing they talk about is there's more, there's an increase in other types of activities. For example, marriage. Uh, there's more hieroglyphs and texts about marriage as well. And marriage is an interrelated strategy with warfare for for expansion, right? For societal expansion and alliance. So actually what you could be seeing is the Maya doing quite well, um, not collapsing. They could actually be expanding. That could be what the hieroglyphs also suggest. Um, it's an unanswered question. Diamond makes a lot of assumptions in his conclusions. Second, two interrelated causes of the collapse from Diamond, out of control population growth and related environmental degradation. So Diamond says population growth and density increased during the late classic, and this resulted in irrevocable environmental degradation. 
Um, as people attempted to feed the growing population, it quickly outstripped, outstripped its resources, farmed the hill, um, which was very quickly eroded. Um, the, va the valley was essentially abandoned not too long after. Um, okay, so this there is evidence for this in Copan, but Copan is just one of several ancient Maya sites. Um, and so McEnany and Negron point out a couple of problems with this argument. One, it's really easy to, well, relatively easy to estimate the population of a site during the late classic, but not earlier periods. So the last time they occupied these sites we're talking about was during the late classic. So the remains it have not been covered up by later sites. So it's easy, pretty easy to estimate that population, but earlier periods, you really can't get a great estimate because the houses, the residential structures, they've all been covered up by later settlements. Um, so for all we know, they might have had quite large populations preceding this period. Um, we just don't know. And another thing is high population growth is a relative concept, okay? so. 27,000 people in Copan sounds like a lot to us for ancient societies. Yeah, that, that's maybe considered, you know, a dense population. But keeping it from a relative perspective, think about it, San Diego State, you, we have over 30,000 students just on campus, right? That's not to mention faculty and all the other people up there. Um, and so, yeah, high population density, maybe, but think about some of the population densities we have today. I mean, China, think China, think India. We have population densities in the billions. So that's a little bit problematic. Diamond assumes 27,000 would have been too much. Um, again, what is high, high population density? It's relative. And uh, another issue is there's a lot of evidence that has shown the Maya practice active environmental management. They were actively reacting to the changes around them to prevent environmental degradation. And there's lots of different evidence to sort of show this. Um, so one of the things McEnany and Negron say is they would refer to this, this environmental management as how the Maya chose to succeed, not fail, not collapse. So what you're seeing here is results from a LIDAR survey um, in the picture on the right. At LIDAR, it's basically a laser that you shoot um, and it refracts light back and tells you, it can basically give you a measure of the distance. And so with this LIDAR survey, we were able to actually reveal all this terracing, um, permanent raised fields, and other environmental adaptations going on at the time. And you can see in the picture, see those little ripply lines next to each other? That's terracing. That's active environmental management, right, to prevent erosion to prevent degradation, to intensify agriculture in the region. So despite this collapse of monumental centers, there's also evidence of really sophisticated environmental management. Um, one reason we don't know much about these techniques, uh, how the Maya, the peasants made a living, is commoners don't write down what they're doing. Uh, most of the stuff that gets embedded in hieroglyphs and writing has a big bias towards elite activities, palaces, wars, marriages. Um, same thing in our society, right? I'm sure that the coronavirus will be written about, 9-11 will be written about, but we don't usually in the history books have, you know, writing on what you and me are doing every day, brushing our teeth and going to work. Um, so the commoners don't typically write this stuff down. So there's not a lot of written evidence for what they were up to. Um, now that we have evidence, and in fairness, this evidence came out after Diamond wrote his piece in Collapse. The Ladar survey came out, I believe, in 2010. And so it shows that stuff scientists didn't know before, that they were indeed actively managing their environment. Um, another example of active management, these are raised fields in a swamp in Belize. And so during the caption, during the late pre-classic and classic periods, Certain forms of agricultural intensification, like swamp reclamation and raised fields seen here, encourage farmers to live near their agricultural plots rather than in the more distant urban centers. Um, so the argument is that one of the reasons that you don't see a high population density in these urban areas after the, the late classic period is because people would have been living near where they were farming 
not in the urban centers. So as people adapted, began to uh, farm in different ways in different regions of the Maya homeland, they would have lived near where they were working, not in these distant urban centers. Um, just with swamp reclamation, uh, just to show, this is a great way to um, conserve water in an area that doesn't have reliable rainfall all year long. So if you get most of the rain between um, sort of May and October, that's great for May and October, but what do you do the rest of the time? So one strategy was the swamp reclamation. You basically build up these mounded fields in the middle of the swamp. You can sort of see it right in the middle of the picture really well. You dig up all the nutrients, the mud, the silt, um, and mound that onto the fields. Um, you dig the canals down on the sides. Fish, ducks, other things can live in the canals. They all defecate, adding fertility to the canals and to the soil. And then you grow your crops on those mounds, those mounded fields, those raised fields. Um, because of decomposition in the tropics, we don't really have evidence of what exactly they were growing on those mounds. Probably corn, though, is a good bet, or other sort of new world crops, maybe beans. And so depopulation of urban centers might simply reflect a shift towards people moving out towards where they were settled, where they were farming, you know, instead of living in urban areas and then traveling out very far every day to go farm. Um, here's just another picture of the same idea, these raised fields in um, sort of the bottom of Mexico, if you will. <clears throat> And so uh, McEnany and Negron say there's at least 27 different adaptive regions, meaning that the Maya had particular, they developed particular strategies and resource management strategies depending on the specific environment they were inhabiting. Right? The environment is not monolithic, nor were their strategies. They adapted specifically to the constraints they faced in the region that they were in. They tailored things to the environment that they inhabited. Um, in the north, again, where elevation's a bit lower, but it's drier, they were able to use something called cenotes um, for water. And remember, these are these sort of uh, natural caves or depressions um, or wells that they would dig up to 75% 75 feet down to store rainwater for the dry season. So you can do that in the north because the elevation is low enough down to the water table, but in the south, the elevation is too high. You can't get to the water table. So they had a different strategy in the south. They built some these underground reservoirs called choltans. You can see it pictured on the slide to store rainwater in places where they couldn't use cenotes or caves. Um, so they're not sort of passive victims in a changing environment. The Maya worked actively to prevent de degradation and increase agricultural productivity. Diamond also mentions drought. Drought exacerbated the problems the Maya were facing at a time when they didn't need more problems. Um, he says that this drove the Maya further towards environmental limitations and collapse. And one way you can tell, uh, how do you know there was a drought during that time? Um, one way is to look at oxygen isotopes in lake bed sediments. So different marine organisms take up calcium carbonate ions to make their shells. And there's different isotopes of oxygen. Uh, let's just say O16 and O18. And O16 is lighter than O18. So during drought conditions, when more water than usual is being evaporated, what will happen is there'll be a higher concentration of O18 versus O16 left in the water and also in the, the calcium carbonate shells that marine organisms make when they sort of grow and develop in the water. And so during drought times, they'll absorb more O18 into their shells because the O16, the lighter isotope, is evaporating um, more relative to the 18. So you can actually tell that there was a period of drought during this time. Um, okay, yeah, there may have been some drought, but uh, a couple of problems. It, it didn't necessarily take the Maya out. Mick and Annie and Negron say that, because Diamond says it's the worst drought in 7,000 years. Well, if it was, it should have damaged all the lowlands, right? Again, which were too high above the water table to use groundwater. They would have really relied on rainfall. Um, but you find the cities with more permanent water supplies, they were the first 
to fall. You would expect the opposite if drought is what drove them to the end. And the authors say the pattern is much more complex than Diamond sort of presents. The abandonment of urban centers, dynastic centers, this doesn't just occur in a year. It occurs over a 125 year period, right? Um, think about what our country looked like in 1900, a little less than 125 years ago, okay? And the cities that would have been most vulnerable to the drought, uh, those in the South, they exhibit a pattern of resilience, actually. Um, again, they actively managed their environments. They couldn't reach the groundwater. They built choltans. They built artificial reservoirs to get them through periods of drought or dry season. Another reason Diamond says the Maya collapse is their rulers didn't do shit to solve their problems. Uh, the Maya rulers were too busy aggrandizing themselves, enriching themselves, building massive architecture, uh, etc. And so Diamond sort of argues the Maya rulers, just like today's CEOs that structure so much of the world that we live in, are more concerned with their own short-term gains versus addressing the long-term problems of the society, including the people, um, making sure they have a decent standard of living, and also the environment. Right, environmental degradation. Leaders failed to basically care, to pay attention, and this drove the Maya to absolute collapse. Um, he sort of draws a parallel between the Maya rulers and our rulers today. He's trying to warn us, if you will, Diamond is. Um, so I know I've mentioned Rex Tillerson in class before. Rex Tillerson was the CEO of ExxonMobil. Um, right up until, uh, right after Donald Trump was elected president, Rex Tillerson then became the Secretary of State for the U.S., um, right? Exxon CEO claims fracking is safe. Rex Tillerson is totally pro-fracking. Um, there's a lot of environmental concerns with groundwater contamination. Fracking, remember, is shooting high-pressured water with, mixed with sand and chemicals into our ground to break apart and release previously locked up natural gas. Um, there's very little regulation around it. A lot of the wells leak methane, which is a powerful greenhouse gas, and a lot of groundwater is contaminated. Um, really dangerous kind of nasty stuff. A lot of the people that are pro-fracking, totally pro-fracking, but do it on poor people's land. Don't do it by me. Don't do it on my ranch. And he actually filed a lawsuit to prevent a fracking operation near his large ranch um, in Texas. But pro-fracking, but don't do it on my land. This is what Diamond's talking about. Our leaders care about themselves, not us. Um, I think you could probably make that argument for some of our leaders today. The evidence is there. McEnany and Negron say, maybe, yeah, maybe the Maya leaders were like our leaders today. They didn't care about their people. Um, but this is a major assumption. We have zero evidence for this. Furthermore, there's evidence to the contrary. A lot of the hieroglyphs of Maya leaders and kings, they're adorned with feathers and other symbols uh, in Maya mythology that symbolize fertility, growth, um, well-being. Uh, and so they say, McEnany and Negron, you can't project the past, or excuse me, the present onto the past. And they sort of accuse Diamond of doing that. He retrofits the present onto the past to try to warn us that we're headed for collapse maybe too. So McEnany and Negron make a different argument. They, they said Maya did not collapse. Um, rather what you see is the society changed. They changed. So Diamond says administrative and town centers were abandoned. This is evidence for the collapse. What do McEnany and Negron say about this? Yeah, true, but it illustrates change, not collapse. What you see is even though the administrative, uh, the large urban centers start becoming abandoned, um, especially in the Southern lowlands, you start seeing other sites pop up and their location is along what looks like major trade routes. And so you're seeing not a collapse, but a shift in the type of activity that's driving the culture. Also, the decrease in population in the southern lowlands where Diamond talks about, Copan, for example, yeah, that happened, but it coincides and corresponds with an increase in population in the north. Um, the north is also more coastally oriented, which is more oriented towards 
convenient trade sites, right? Routes near water. Um, cities, towns, locations, settlements are often located near trade routes. Think about the railroads in the U.S., right? What happens when a new railroad gets built? New towns pop up everywhere. What happens when uh, a new highway gets built and the old road, no one ever goes along the old way. Um, a lot of those businesses close down. And so a lot of activities are located near these major routes of transportation and trade. Um, they're strategically located, if you will. And McEnany and Negron argue this is what happened to the Maya. They relocated. Their spheres of influence shifted. Elites were no longer concerned with monumental architecture, but trade. And so what you see is a shift from the classic ancient Maya um, monumental architecture, shifting away from that type of activity, this highly centralized hierarchical settlement, and social organization towards trade, towards mercantile activity, towards more dispersed settlement. And so many post-classic sites after the collapse that Diamond talks about uh, were strategically located to enhance trade. Uh, the example I have for you is the site of Tulum. And so Tulum is located at a perfect place for trading. It's sea on one side, land on the other, which is perfect for coastal to inland trading and vice versa. Um, there's a cove, there's a break in the cliffs, and a place to land, which would be perfect for trading canoes. Um, this characteristic might be the very reason the Maya settled here, right? It was a great site for trade. And Tulum was inhabited for a long time. It was occupied until most of the inhabitants were wiped out by Spanish disease via colonists. So even though monumental architecture ceased or was scaled back and population declined in some parts of the south, um, post-classic Maya, post-collapse, Maya society was vibrant, uh, particularly in terms of trade, mercantile activity. Um, and again, the decrease in population in the South coincides with an increase in population in the North. And so what you're seeing is a shift. The Maya didn't collapse. They changed, they adapted to the new opportunities presenting themselves. Uh, you start seeing new architectural forms pop up. No longer these large monumental architectures, um, but sort of small. One example is these small circular shrines associated with cacao groves. And cacao was an important food trading item for the post-classic Maya. Um, so there would it would be sort of enshrined in the agriculture, or excuse me, in the architecture, if you will. Um, we, do, we do the same thing, right? We put symbolically important things, flags, different things like that. We enshrine them into the things we build and set up. And so you see these circular shrines start to pop up, spread out, uh, associated with cacao groves. Um, and it's showing you elites are, they're responding to new opportunities, right? They're involved with trade now. Um, that it's probably in response to this increasingly interconnected pan Mesoamerican world. Um, no longer these centralized, highly urban societies, right? Relying on a bunch of peasants below them. Divine rulership, the centralized hierarchy gave way to new forms of social organization, new forms of statecraft. You see more dispersed settlement also. Again, not, no longer centralized and hierarchical, hierarchical, but more decentralized and dispersed. The ag agricultural strategy we start to see is, again, not centralized and hierarchical. Rather, it's these self-sufficient households practicing different forms of agriculture, whether that be extensive permaculture, right? Sort of um, extensive, like the cacao grows, right? Um, farming permanently in different areas. They also practice other types of growing crops. Um, but the key is it's no longer sort of centralized, top-down management. You have self-sufficient households producing for themselves um, and also for trade. So today, there are nearly 7 million Maya descendants alive. Um, collapse they're, they're still alive they're still here go ask the maya go down to belize and ask the maya how they feel about jared diamond's interpretation that they collapsed disappeared gone failed um no the maya are still fucking here so collapse or change um mickey and, and negron and a lot of the evidence would suggest and the fact that there's still seven million maya alive today that they didn't collapse but 
changed. And actually, the Maya represent this really successful strategy of long-term resilience. Um, they were resilient, meaning they were able to withstand shocks and changes to the system without collapsing. They were able to adapt to change um, in reaction to changing circumstances around them. They're resilient, flexible. Uh, we call it resilience, which we'll be talking about when we turn from the break. Resilience is the ability of a system to absorb disturbance, shocks, and whether that's climatological, social, economic, and still retain its basic function and structure. Um, re re resiliency often, re there's a few ways to achieve resiliency. One is flexibility, being flexible. So like one example of resiliency that we can relate to today actually, um, we're not a highly resilient society in part because we're large scale, we're complex, and we rely on large external inputs, whether that be fossil fuels or human energy. Um, sooner or later, something's gonna interfere with that input. The gas prices go up, um, what, or if coronavirus comes around and no one can go to work anymore. But we have some flexibility built in, in the sense that most of us have computers or internet or can at least get access to them. And so we're still able to teach class and take class, um, but we're doing it online. That would be one example, albeit not an ideal one, of resiliency, right? Um, this massive sort of change, the coronavirus has basically shut down our lives, but we have some flexibility, some other fallbacks built in to our society, technology in this case, so that we're still sort of teaching, right? We're still sort of taking class, again, albeit it's not the same. Um, Another example of not being resilient. Last semester when I was teaching this class, uh, we had a power outage. And so I showed up to class and the lights were off. Um, people were sitting in the dark and there's no windows in that room and no backup generator. And so that is a really good example of not being resilient. We are so used to the stability of electricity, of coming into that lighted room every single day, that we never really practiced our ability to withstand shocks to that system so that the power goes out and we have no other way to hold class because there's not even windows in that room. Um, so you couldn't even see people. It was completely pitch black. We just had to cancel class. Um, we're gonna talk much more about resiliency and the trade-offs inherent in it. Again, large scale societies like our own tend to be less resilient because they rely on large inputs. Um, oh, we'll talk more about that when we return from the break. So the Maya, what you want to know about the Maya is they seem to represent um, a highly resilient society that didn't collapse, but rather adapted and changed in the face of changing opportunities, changing environment, and a changing world. Um, Nick and Annie and Negron would say that it's not evidence of environmental degradation um, for the Maya. Rather, it's evidence of a sustainable livelihood. When one environment like Copan wasn't working out, um, the Maya didn't just disappear, right? They adapted, they moved, they changed what they were doing. They are what we would call resilient. And so the Maya case highlights several important issues, one of which is this concept of resilience. Again, resilience is the ability of social systems and ecosystems to continue functioning despite severe and unexpected stresses. Um, weeds are a really good example of resiliency, right? You can completely pave over an entire ecosystem, destroy it, but wait enough time, sometimes not even very long, and weeds start to pop up through the cracks. They're actually, weeds are evolved in marginal, marginalized environments. Um, so they're inherently resilient. Um, so no matter what sort of happens to that ecosystem, they usually can find a way to still survive, still pop back up, resilient. Um, resiliency is important for sustainability, for increasing sustainability. And so we'll talk much more about how all of this is related after we return from the break. Um, just a couple of things before I let you go. Uh, there is a quiz on the material from industrial food production and also the Maya that we just talked about today. Um, it'll be up today, but you have until the Tuesday that we return from break to finish that. I gave you guys, um, you already had the whole spring break. 
but I give you I'm going to give you a few extra days so that if you don't finish it um, before break, you don't have to do it during break. You still have a few days after we come back to go ahead and wrap it up. Don't fall too far behind. Um, but I think you guys should take some time off for spring break. You've definitely earned it. Uh, so with that said, we'll be continuing with this topic, sustainability in other types of societies throughout space and time, when we return from the break up until the second exam. We're going to look at other case studies. We're going to look at rice-based polyculture in Bali, Indonesia, um, someone where, somewhere where we've imported the Green Revolution to. And so we'll kind of take a look at their traditional system, which was really resilient uh, and successful and sort of what's happened since the green revolution has been imported over there and we'll also look at some case studies in the amazon basin in south america so how have other societies done things how have they managed their resources have they been successful or not what can we learn from them the way we are doing things today in the u.s industrial food production is not set in stone and is not an inevitable outcome of humans it is cultural it is created by people it can be changed by people what can we learn from other societies in order to become more sustainable ourselves all right um, don't forget about the quiz that's due by the Tuesday after we come back from break I'll post announcements about all of this I hope you guys do get a chance for some rest and some time off and please contact me if you have questions or want to talk about anything I'm here to help all right take care guys happy spring break take it easy on yourselves you deserve it <laughs>